Second of the two presentations that we do have today will showcase how libraries respond to the challenge of redesigning or redeveloping spaces to provide the infrastructure that supports scholarship and learning, brings communities together, and facilitates encounters with cultural heritage collections. So firstly, I would like to introduce our first speaker, um, and he is Brian O'Donnell, Deputy Director and Head of Estates at the National Library. Brian is a conservation architect and fellow of the Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland. He joined the National Library of Ireland as Head of Estates in 2019, and he's a member of the NLI Senior Management Team and is now the Deputy Director. His role includes future planning, estate management, sustainability, disaster planning, as well as security, which is also within his remit. And he's a member of the Consortium of European Research Libraries Security Working Group. Brian is going to present to us today on reimagining the National Library of Ireland. So I'm going to pass over now to Brian. All right. Um, so yeah, uh, Katrina's explained the title, um, which is a kind of a loose interpretation of the title of the presentation. So apologies if, if I'm not completely on uh, or on a slightly sidetracked message from the, the title of the of the show. Um, uh, I'm just trying to get my screens to work. So uh, the, yeah, this quote from Benjamin Disraeli, which is often misattributed and misquoted, but for us, it kind of, um, it, it says a lot about what we do. Um, that you know, there's a huge uncertainty about any of our plans or any of our projects, um, and so we we just always have this in mind. Um, that we need to be kind of constantly reactive and responsive to adjust and adapt um, to how the projects are progressing. Uh, to give you a bit of just background about the National Library of Ireland, we're in the city centre of Dublin. Uh, we're right next door to. Leinster House, which is the Irish Parliament building. Um, we're in a kind of cultural uh, stroke governmental uh, government uh, block of the city block, which also includes the National Gallery, the National Museum, the Natural History Museum um, on the foresight. Um, we have uh, our main building uh, dates from uh, 1890. Um, and there are older and younger wings attached on to that. There's an 1827 wing, um, which uh, used to be the old School of Art. And then down the road and, and significantly not connected um, physically, um, there is a terrace of buildings, uh, which uh, date from uh, the 1750s uh, to the 1860s. Um, and they're, they're adapted to provide uh, additional services, both public services and staff uh, accommodation areas. And you'll see to the, to the extreme left there, the, the grounds of Trinity College Dublin are, are just at the, at the end of the street. Uh, we also have a number of off-site locations. Um, some of these are um, joint ventures and uh, partnerships, which we've developed to University College Dublin, um, is across uh, on the other side of Stephen's Green from us, and we have the uh, a partnership to present the Museum of Literature Ireland, and that's a fairly new uh, venture from uh, 2019. And we have the National Photographic Archive in Temple Bar, um, about 500 600 meters from the from the main buildings, um, and then we have a temporary location with the Bank of Ireland in College Green. Um, which uh, contains our Seamus Heaney uh, Listen Now Again exhibition. And then we have a number of um, off-site uh, storage facilities, uh, one shared with Trinity College Dublin, uh, one shared with the National Gallery of Ireland, and one uh, a co a contract um, with a commercial storage provider. And, but in the centre of our main historic building, we have our main reading room, uh, which is in the in that um, building dating from 1890. So uh, just to kind of put context into what how we're operating, and and first of all the kind of the the obvious needs to be stated that like 
obviously this is our story this is us reacting to our situation and and everyone has to has to adapt to their own circumstances building types organizational structures and funding arrangements um, but hopefully some of the lessons we have learned or some of the ways in which we have operated might be of some assistance to some of you um, the National Library of Ireland is an independent national cultural institution funded by the Department of um, Tour Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gaeltacht, Sports and Media. Um, sorry, back up. Um, and as such, uh, with the department with that long a name, they're, they're a busy lot. And so uh, we need to uh, make sure that we uh, stay in touch with them regularly and 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 partnership is an important aspect of that relationship the other big partner that we have is that um maintenance and capital investment services are provided by the state property service which is the office of public works in ireland um and but the capital projects will need uh the department's sponsorship um to to both pay for them and to support them uh, we pay our own security, energy bills, furniture, IT costs, all those sorts of things um, on a day-to-day -day basis, but not our maintenance costs. Um, so we we still need to manage the relationships um, to ensure that our maintenance are addressed um, as the Office of Public Works have a never-ending list of requests from right across the state sector. Um, and, and that includes other, other libraries, and of the, and the other cultural national cultural institutions, having our maintenance outsourced um, to a government body means that we're never having to balance whether to buy a collection or repair a roof. They're they're separate um, they're separate separate matters. Um, but you know, where outsourcing does remove a level of control, it removes our decision making. You know, and and the prioritization is 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 made by others and we have just to make our state our case as best we can. So it's difficult to identify an ideal structure, but just putting in context of, of how we are operating. Um, and in this talk, I want to kind of distinguish between kind of minor upgrades um, that we can do within our own skill base and, and authorization uh, generally with some minor support externally. Um, works requiring kind of building contractors that you know have some level of official documentation around it like needing fire certificates or or, or sign off uh, by of, of officially by designers um, and then the larger capital projects um, which are of much larger scale uh, much larger budget and and take a, a much longer time to complete um, firstly, I'll just kind of talk a little bit about our uh, and introduce, I guess, our West Wing project. Uh, that's the West Wing of the main building. You would have seen that photograph uh, back at the start. Um, uh, the West Wing a capital development project. So that's a refurbishment of that existing wing, which was previously collection storage um, from its from when it was built um, in 1890. There's six levels. Uh, and we're hoping to convert it now uh, to provide uh, a new cafe, shop, four levels of exhibition space um, uh, and an education space. So I suppose public cultural interpretation space um, to, to kind of enhance and develop our um, public service offering in, the, in that area. Um, in addition, in a rear courtyard, we're hoping to uh, build an extension which will provide uh, vertical circulation. And that will give us um, a kind of a fully accessible to all six levels, but also to levels and half levels um, uh, within the existing building that currently don't have full accessibility. So a mixture of kind of CGI graphics and, and plans to follow now, just to kind of give you a feel for what that looks like. Um, you might have noticed at this start, uh, I might be able, actually, I might just flick very quickly back. I should have said that at the start. The distinctive thing about our um, our building is how tight we are at the front um, to Leinster House, to the Parliament building, which is a hard security line, um, and which means that we have very little space at the front. And then our boundary with the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland is, is 
very tight at the back. So we're on a, a very constrained uh, site uh, for the main building. Sorry, I'm jumping backwards and forwards. Okay, so really we have very little scope, but just to do um, superficial enhancement of finishes um, in the front area, improve the um, the ramp to access that's there, and and just make that um, that ramp more compatible with current um, accessibility rules and regulations. Um, a partial floor plan of the of that building or showing the west half of the building um, indicates that entrance gate off the, off the street at the, with the red arrow and then that leads you in through the external colonnade um, into the existing main entrance hall and that will bring you down into the colored areas of the of the of the, uh, of the plan there um, which show the the cafe and bookshop space in purple and um, at the back of the building, um, the, uh, the courtyard area uh, with the stairs, the lift and atrium-like space. Uh, this is a, an image of what that new cafe space might look like. The, the area was set book storage. Um, it was about 350,000 volumes across the six floors. Um, the, the structure is that it's concrete floors for every second floor and then infill mezzanines where the timber shelving uprights, as you can see, some of them are proposed to be retained there. Um, and they support a cast iron flooring grid uh, between the shelving uprights. So we're keeping a sense of that because we're very conscious that, you know, well, we, we obviously all think about our cultural heritage collections, but we have cultural heritage buildings as well. And so we're very keen that the story of the buildings and the character and uh, significance of the buildings are retained um, as we deal with any you know, modifications and adjustments needed to provide a, a kind of a modern library service. So the, you can see there the, uh, where the capstone flooring is being turned up on its side to act as balustrading um, and then retaining some of those um, shelvings to, to give character and, and kind of a unique sense of place, we hope, in the cafe space. And similarly, in the retail space, the other end of that same floor, um, again, just using the, uh, retaining some extent of the, uh, of the shelving uprights and the, the cast iron flooring. Um, but we have to really clear out some extent of them to create the open floor areas because otherwise you're you're expecting people to walk through a forest of, of uprights in in public spaces the doors to the left open out into the new um vertical circulation atrium space um and on the uh, first floor that the areas colored pink in this plan are the two are kind of open access um seated study spaces which overlook uh, the cafe and the restaurant kind of a noisy study spaces without restriction so that you don't have to be a reader to be there uh, to be a registered reader that is um it's kind of informal noisy uh, study space uh, and then that's an image of what that uh, infilling the courtyard is looking like um with the new stairs and lift and a section cutting through the building with the um, Kildare Street on the immediate left. And, and then you can see the levels of the building. What the section there doesn't show is the intermediate um, mezzanine floors, which add to the existing four solid floors that are there. Um, and then that new uh, atrium space, stairs and lift in the center. On the uh, basement space, um, the lower ground floor, um, it's a kind of a, a brick vaulted space, um, which we're turning into an exhibition space, and then there'll be additional uh, toilets and, and public services there to augment our existing Victorian toilets um, in the building. And a long section through the building just shows the, um, the exhibition space on the top floor, which is in, in an attic space, and we're currently designating that for the Seamus Heaney um exhibition uh to be to relocate to there um a temporary exhibition space and then education center um retail space cafe space and a 
exhibition in the lower ground floor that is kind of centered around our other uh, Nobel Prize winning poet, uh, W.B. Yeats. Um, on the first floor, that just shows a kind of, again, a um, how that relationship to keeping the central stairs um, in the cast iron stairs as a secondary escape route um, structures the each floor to the left and right of that. So we've got the education space with um, en suite, I suppose you call it, uh, toilets uh, for, for, for just to control the groups easier. Um, and then a temporary exhibition space, uh, which is proposed to commence with uh, Sir Bob Geldof's uh, Band-Aid uh, collection, which he donated to the National Library a few years ago. Uh, this gives you a say another feel of what that uh, feel of what that ex education space might look like. Um, it is uh, again a flexible space, again using the same motif for clearing away uh, the mezzanine um, cast iron floors for part of it, um, and retaining elements of it though, and and the original uh, small spiral staircases um, to retain those elements of cultural heritage. Uh, and again, we're using again that kind of that keeping parts of the mezzanine uh, floors for a small kind of spotlight uh, display case uh, floor, so that we can do kind of small dedicated uh, exhibitions on on a particular topic. And then the top floor, just showing in blue there, the that space that we're uh, assigning to the Seamus Heaney exhibition uh, at, at a level. And that's a kind of CGI of what that uh, looks like. Uh, this is prior to any exhibition interpretation. It's just more of a, a space planning CGI rather than a, a rather than an exhibition uh, interpretation. So, and then uh, part of that, obviously, uh, as every project should, we are building in sustainability and, and accessibility measures. Um, where we can uh, within, you know, within the limits and with within the within the character and the the correct manner that's that right for dealing with protected structures and, and historic buildings. Um, and so, you know, we're building in secondary glazing and double glazing where original glazing doesn't occur. We are dealing with um, putting in attic and floor insulation but uh, it's it's difficult to uh, to do anything wall insulation in the historic building um, and then for accessibility adding new public evacuation rated lift um, and providing uh, a change in place uh, toilet facility for those with greater needs as well as generally uh, more accessible toilets and more toilets uh, generally at, at different levels. And some of the phases of the project have already been completed. Uh, phase one in 2019, uh, we fitted out the former Princeton Drawings Department as a new bookstore. You can see it on the center image on the, on the right. Um, and we have fitted out the former seminar space as a Princeton Drawing Storage. That's the lower right image. Um, and with decanted uh, 350,000 volumes or so um, from the West Wing to the new bookstore and to off-site uh, uh, commercial storage. Um, phase two of that, but then when the West Wing was, was cleared of collections, we were able to, for the first time, go into it properly and do opening up works, remove non-original uh, partitions and changes that had occurred, and basically get a much better understanding of what condition the, the building was in uh, when we had freed it of the risk of, of uh, having collections in place. Uh, planning permission was granted in January 24, earlier this year, and uh, the main tender we're hoping will issue um, by the end of the year. And, and one of the other phases that we've just recently completed is that we've converted the former cafe um, to a new lecture theatre for 100 people. So that's kind of replacing the, the seminar space that we've assigned to Prince and Drawing. So it's been a kind of a game of Tetris, if you like, that everything's getting shuffled around to try and find a permanent uh, solution for, for each service and each activity. 
Um, in this lecture theatre, we've provided a level stage area and an adjustable lectern to aid our accessibility. And we have a removable front row there um, of seats so that we can accommodate increased wheelchair numbers uh, as required, depending on the event. So in kind of parallel to that, um, you know, the West Wing project, you know, we, we've been carrying out a number of further enabling works, um, kind of in essence, waiting for this big project takes time. It takes an awful lot of patience. Um, so we set about a strategy of doing what we can when we can. Um, and that was to kind of have a series of initial enabling works in the kind of broader campus to eliminate elements of work that don't fit within the geographical target of where the contract will be. So the the the, oh, sorry, uh, the future um, uh, the future work is 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 ring fenced into the West Wing, but that you know in reality the activities of the library that are affected will spread across the whole campus. Uh, uh, you know affecting how we work and and how we organize ourselves. Um, so we've carried out a number of um, projects, uh, including creating new security suites, um, creating a new prints and drawings reading space and, and donor reception space, uh, because the previous prints and drawing space, as I've shown, was converted to a, a bookstore. Um, and then staff relocations to reorganize um, the departments and reorganize how, how we're operating. Uh, we create a new manuscript reading room. Um, and I've shown you the picture of the, the lecture theatre. So part of the aim here was to create enabling phases that weren't too big or weren't too expensive that would scare away support or, or funding. Um, and at all times, they're, they are described as being uh, within, you know, within the total goal and within the aims and, and deliverability of, of the total project. So a couple of examples of those before we had you know, a former toilet that was acted as a tea station for 20 or 30 staff and, and way undersized for, for the numbers that needed it. Um, by reorganizing and the staff areas, some work areas, we were able to get better, more efficient staff layouts. And that allowed us um, to create, convert two offices into a, a new uh, staff canteen. Um, this is outside the main building down in the other side of the campus um, in that terrace of buildings that I showed earlier. Um, and as part of that, we're trying to, you know, I suppose, invest in the staff, invest in the staff's work areas to kind of show them that we value their input and, and that they're not being left behind, um, that the focus of the job isn't always on public spaces um, and public services. Um, here, just on the left, you see we're, we're using items from the collection to bring the collection into the staff work areas on a daily basis. So this graphic um, hides an acoustic wall to control the, the kind of tinniness and the acoustic reverberation that you often get in staff uh, canteens. Um, that former tea station um, and one on another floor, which were former toilets, have been converted into Zoom rooms and again, cladding the walls with uh, collection material um, uh, that are on acoustic uh, paneling so that we uh, get a better quality of sound um, in those rooms. And then re-evaluating spaces that, that kind of over time have been um, kind of mis mis misused, I suppose might be the, the word, um, that, you know, for, for gradually uh, occurrences have, have made a room that was intended for a different use gradually get um, sidelined. Um, so this large art book room then was, was an office space for a long time and then kind of ad hoc storage started taking over. So re-evaluating re the space um, has created the opportunity to, to make it into a new prints and drawings uh, reading space and a, a, don a space for donors and, and reception space for, for small events and, and groups. Um, and that was a, you know, a, a kind of fairly concise um, schedule of work 
to upgrade that space with, with new lighting and, and uh, the flooring was upgraded and enhanced uh, in order to do that. Yeah. With work areas, again, so a lot of the areas have been um, not addressed for quite a bit of time. And we're conscious that with these with this Western project, with other projects that we're hoping to roll out, um, we wanted, we needed a lot of support and there's workload come out of that or on that rests on the staff. And so we wanted to show them that look, it's a two way street and that their spaces would be addressed and improved um, as we uh, would go. So there was old dated carpets, um, kind of random ad hoc, uh, furniture arrangements um, and quite dated furniture. Um, and so by kind of replanning the room um, and uh, we could fit in a uh, better layout for staff, provide sit-down desks, and we made the clear decision to set to provide um, uh, to provide uh, white desks to distinguish them from the old oak desks. Um, and then another project um, was converting the old um, manuscript space to moving it down to the ground floor, making it more accessible and removing an inaccessible um, exhibition space. So the aims were um, to use uh, the environment of change um, created by the pro uh, capital project to introduce a broader uh, improvements generally, um, to reduce energy use where we can, to, uh, to create the opportunity to reorganize departments and remove and uh, to improve logical workflows um, and break down any kind of departmental silos that were um, occurring. Um, and also to improve staff morale by front loading the benefits to staff and reward them for the increased change and in workload that they were having to take on board um, and to demonstrate so that investment in the staff and their work areas. And does it work? Well, we think so. Like we're getting very positive feedback uh, from each team that's affected. We've moved about 80% of the overall staff um, uh, without any dissent or union obstruction. Um, departments have been reorganized. Um, I, I think what we've done is also create a bigger belief that actually the infrastructure project might actually happen this time. Um, and it gets the, that kind of staff disruption things in ahead of time rather than doing it when we're all exhausted after the main build occurs. So we keep juggling. We keep a good few balls in the air. Some enabling projects will progress, some will stall. We do what we can when we can. And we're socializing that change with these small projects, um, uh, you know, so that so that we're kind of that whole notion of change management becomes more more acceptable to all um, with benefits uh, to the staff areas. But like it's not always an, an open door. And if at first we don't succeed, we keep asking, we rethink, we represent, we're persistent with a smile uh, rather than being alienating. Um, and we're kind of always seeking to find ways in which we can um, justify the changes we're making, justify the funding we're looking for uh, and the support we want from the, from the different agents uh, that, that we need to, to take on board. Um, and we're making, uh, so we're, our conclusion, I suppose, is that, you know, make progress where you can, when you can. Um, big projects fix big things, but often for only parts of the organization. And they can be stopped at any time. And there's no guarantee that they will go to completion. So we keep nibbling away on small stuff while waiting for the big stuff to happen. However, as I said at the start, every organization needs to find the solution that matches their circumstances and everyone needs to find their own path to enhancement. Thank you. Well, thanks a million, Brian. Um, that was really, really fantastic. Um, and it was exactly relevant to the event theme. So no worries there. Uh, it was really exciting. And it was, I think, you know, I could see the comments coming in in the chat. 
people really always love to see images. So it's really great to see the images, but it's also really great to hear the approach you've taken and how much can be achieved on quite a small scale. And I should say, um, as a Dubliner myself, um, anyone planning a holiday in Dublin, the public toilets in the National Library of Ireland are the nicest in Dublin, if not in the world. And I can also relate having been the librarian at the National Gallery of Ireland in the 90s to the whole uh, dealing with the OPW, who are lovely, lovely, but as you say, with a very long list. So um, we're going to move on now to our second speaker. And I know you'll all have loads of questions for Brian, but uh, please hold on to those. And uh, once our second speaker is finished, uh, you'll be able to have the chance to ask them as well. So our second speaker is Emma Wisher, and she is the Assistant Director of Academic Engagement and Student Experience and Deputy Director of the Libraries and Museums at the University of St. Andrews. And her title is uh, Opening Up Space and Collections, the Main Library Redevelopment at the University of St. Andrews. Over to you, Emma. Thanks, Katrina. Um, so uh, I'm delighted to be with you this afternoon. Um, as Katrina says, I'm Emma Wisher. I have uh, one of the longest job titles in the world, but I am Assistant Director for Academic Engagement and Student Experience and Deputy Director of Libraries and Museums at St Andrews. And I'm going to focus this afternoon on the recent redevelopment of the main library at St Andrews, which took place in 2022 to 23. Um, but it's really a story of two linked projects, um, as the creation of new high quality study space in the centre of town was made possible by an earlier move of collections to a new facility, which is down the road in Guardbridge. And together, these developments have enabled us to open up both space for collections and space for study and research. At the heart of this is a principle around space and collections being co-located, as this is something that's fundamental to our users in St Andrews. So I'm also uh, going to hopefully show you quite a few images. I'm sure space is a consideration for many of us, and often we find that study space and collection space can be seen as competing. And space is a particular concern for us in St Andrews, uh, for the university as a whole. Um, if you know anything about St Andrews, if you've been there, it's a, a medium sized town on the east coast of Scotland. And the town and the university are very much intertwined, the university having been there for over 600 years. So university buildings uh, nestle beside and in between other buildings in the town. And there's no real scope for the university to grow within the footprint of St Andrews itself. It's also the case that student life at St Andrews is centred around an in-person experience in the town itself. Um, and as during the pandemic, we went from having about 8,000 to about 10,000 students, there's considerable pressure on the capacity of all kinds of spaces for teaching, learning and research. Students and staff at St Andrews are intensive library users, both in terms of visits to the libraries, but also in their high level of collections use, both borrowing of print items and accessing electronic resources. We had um, restricted opening in St Andrews for a relatively longer period during the pandemic compared to some of the other university libraries in Scotland. Um, and we were still getting adverse comments in last year's NSS about this, um, showing that the access to our buildings and our collections is really important to our students. So given that this is a university problem, um, the university is obviously looking at solutions and the development of a professional services hub at Guardbridge, which is about four and a half miles down the road for St Andrews is one of these solutions to the issue of not having space to expand in town. Walter Bower House is named after a medieval chronicler um, and it was built on the site of the former paper mill in Garbridge and it was designed to be a space where professional services colleagues can work flexibly and a number of professional service teams have moved wholesale into the facility when it opened in 2021 and so that's freed up some much needed space in the town centre. For us, this represented an opportunity to bring together some scattered research collections and to make them browsable and accessible freely to users for the first time. 
So in the mid uh, 2000s, to manage space in the main library more efficiently in town, um, we'd begun to move items into offsite storage. So some of this storage was in St Andrews itself, some of it was in the basement of the main library, and some of it was offsite as far as Dundee. And these collections that we'd moved offsite had grown organically until we had about 13 kilometres of books and items in these different locations. So moving to Walter Bower House was a real opportunity to bring things back together, but the, our collections team had to work hard to organise about 20 different collection sequences so that they were ready to be moved into the space uh, and going to be integrated and browsable. And in the summer of 2021, we then employed Harrow Green to move all of the items to the new facility. And you can see on the left image there, uh, some crates stacked up, ready to go into the new rolling stack that we had. Although all of these items had always been requestable from storage, we're really excited to make them more accessible um, and to make them browsable in these rolling stacks, which um, researchers can access directly um, in the Walter Bower House facility. What we also have at Walter Bower is a small reading room. Um, so researchers can get the items out and can work on them in situ um, if they want to. Items are also requestable to be sent up to the main library in town um, because some people will feel that Garbridge is too far away. Um, although it's worth noting that actually in many ways, uh, the site at Garbridge is better connected um, than St Andrews itself as it's in walking distance of the railway station at Lucas um, and there is no, no train station in St Andrews itself. As well as collections, some of our staff teams also relocated to Walter Power House. And again, that helped free up space on the basement level of the main library. In total, about 50% of the collections previously held in the main library were moved. Um, so that represents over 500,000 print books and journal volumes. And if you would like to know more about the move to Walter Bower and about the collections there, um, I would highly recommend getting in touch with um, Helen Folds, uh, my colleague, who's our Assistant Director for Library Collections and Digital Services, and she'll be able to tell you all about it. So the move of collections and staff provided an opportunity to reimagine the space in the main library in town. The main library is a 1970s brutalist building on four floors and it is right in the middle of town but um, located behind North Street, um, low to the skyline and largely concealed behind other buildings, um, not by accident. In total, we have eight libraries or library managed spaces, uh, including uh, the reading room at Walter Bower, but the main library is by far the largest and most heavily used of our spaces. St Andrews as a university lacks large spaces in town where students can gather, and so the library functions as a key hub for our students to meet one another and to spend time between classes. And staff, particularly academic staff in arts and divinity schools, also regular visitors to the main library and heavy users of the collections there. Previous to the redevelopment, the capacity of the main library was at about 1100 and pressure for space was keenly felt by students. We also had ongoing issues with the infrastructure of the building with regular complaints about heating and problems with toilets um, and toilets is going to be a bit of a running theme, I'm afraid. Working with architects from Atkins, we put together a business case around reimagining the basement level, known as level one, as high quality study space environments with a variety of different study options. Level two, the entrance level, would also undergo significant remodeling, including the creation of a single help desk, bringing all of our service points together. Toilet provision would be increased and improved on all floors and a new heating and ventilation system installed. So our overall aim was to increase the number and the choice of study spaces, as well as bringing the whole building up to standard in terms of the level of use and better meeting the needs and expectations of our users. Stakeholder response to the early plans led to us decreasing the density of spaces on level one in favor of larger, higher quality spaces. And our outline business case came in at a difficult time. Uh, this was in kind of early 2022. And we were finding that costs were rapidly spiraling and supply chain issues um, were giving a problem as we emerged from the pandemic. So that meant that we were into the business of value engineering quite early on and we lost a planned refurbishment to the cafe at the entrance level as part of that value engineering. It also meant there was a high level of nervousness um, around sharing plans for the redevelopment before we could confirm that it would go ahead. 
So we essentially had to have plans in place to close the main library building from mid-May with all of our service continuity plans in place, but not prepare any of our users for the fact that this would be happening until we were pretty much up against it and getting ready to close. And this was about the point at which I joined uh, the team at St Andrews in February 2022. And I have to admit, I found it extremely uncomfortable not to be able to communicate to users or to engage with the wider group more directly as we finalised the plans for the redevelopment. Luckily, we had um, quite a lot of excellent user insight, which we'd gathered over a period of years. So that informed the choices that we were making about the spaces, including uh, a limited amount of stakeholder engagement. Once we got the green light, it was all systems go in terms of preparing the building and putting out comms to our users. In recognition of the importance of our collections to postgraduate students and researchers, we had negotiated with the contractors who were FES uh, to have access to the building each afternoon, Monday to Friday, so we could run a click and collect service. Uh, to protect the collections whilst work was going on overhead to install the new heating and cooling units, FES constructed a series of tents uh, made out of plastic sheeting. Uh, so we then had to don our hard hats, steel toe caps and high vis to go in, enter the relevant tunnels and collect the books. Um, and FES ordered a whole array of steel toe cap sizes for us for this purpose. And I can tell you it's very difficult to get hold of size four and size five uh, steel toe caps. I should point out uh, at this point that some of the pictures I'm using are mine and some are taken by university photographers and some by the Atkins photographer. Um, so any low quality images such as these ones are likely to, to be ones that I took um, as part of uh, my record of what we were doing. The summer works focus mainly on the infrastructure elements, including the new toilet areas on floors two, three, and four. And my obsession with our toilets clearly started at this point where we had them stacked up and waiting to be installed there on level three. The most noisy and disruptive of the level one works also took place at this point, although some elements of the program had to be rearranged due to supply chain issues. This meant that we had to find and install a temporary help desk at fairly short notice on level two, as the old one had already been dismantled and removed and the new one had not arrived. With a lot of hard work on the part of our staff, FES and estates, we just about managed to be ready to be open again for the start of semester. The toilets were not quite finished and we had some areas, including where the new help desk was going to go, barriered off. And work on level one was due to continue throughout the semester and into 2023. The new toilets uh, did represent a vast improvement when opened. Um, and you can see I've very proudly taken some pictures here of the sinks on level three and a shot of the new gender neutral toilets on the right on level two. So we felt we at least had something to show for the summer closure, even though we hadn't got as far as we'd hoped and the new heating system wasn't yet commissioned. We needed several water shutdowns to make this happen, which we planned carefully looking at historical user data to find the least worst time to be closed. Um, you may or may not know about Raisin Weekend, which is a St Andrews tradition uh, where new students are set challenges by their academic parents uh, who were students in the years above. And this culminates in a foam fight on Raisin Monday. And traditionally, this is a quiet weekend in terms of footfall in the libraries. So we planned our closure for the water shutdown at that point. Throughout the project, FES were really great at understanding that any disruption must be managed and they worked with us around a stop protocol for drilling and a no noisy works period during revision exams. But we did have to have some give and take um, because you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs um, and we needed to allow them to progress with the works on level one so they could be com complete. So we had to put up with a fair amount of drilling uh, and the library uh, staff based there put up with more drilling than most over this period. It's fortunate that level two, the entrance level, has always been a noisier, more social space and therefore this provided something of a buffer between the works on level one and the silent upper floors of the library. And we had very few complaints about noise, um, which was excellent. Um, and it was great that at this point, we were able to communicate really frequently and proactively with users to manage expectations. We also planned another big chunk of work over the Christmas period. Um, this was slightly difficult to schedule as we discovered that the buildings industry effectively closes down for a couple of weeks over Christmas. Um, but we were able to negotiate with FES and get the work done in two phases, a pre and a post Christmas phase. 
And where possible, we continue to allow access to collections, even when the library couldn't be used for study space, in recognition that some, for some researchers, this is a really key period of activity. And the work over Christmas included the new help desk going in. So again, users could see progress when they returned from the break. The last push in spring 2023 was to complete the level one works. As long as things progressed smoothly, we were on track to make the new spaces on level one available for the revision period in April. We planned to close the space again for snagging in midway once mid May once the exams were passed. And here you can see our electronic rolling stack uh, on level one from Brunzeal. Um, and again, if anybody is interested in the electric rolling stack, Helen would be the person to speak to um, about that one. Having collections on this floor was not just a question of needing space for storage, but was again in line with our principle about space and collections belonging together. The other picture we've got here is of the tea prep area. We wanted to recognise that our users spend long hours in the building and have expectations around facilities for making drinks. We debated adding a fridge at one point, but we decided for us this was at this point a bridge too far. Some elements of the design of the whole redevelopment were informed by similar features included at Walter Bauer House because the same firm of architects had been involved and there are many kitchen areas scattered throughout the building there. So far, I've talked about elements of the design which were very much planned and intended. However, I also wanted to mention some aspects which came as something of a surprise to us, but which have turned out to be really effective. This is an area on level two that is now partially enclosed by this display shelving. And I confess when I first saw it, I was somewhat dismayed, um, not least by the fact that I'm clearly not very good at interpreting plans or spotting things on architects' visualizations. It wasn't so much the aesthetics of this particular setup that bothered me as, the sheer, as much as the sheer amount of work I foresaw in creating and maintaining enough displays to fill all of those um, display units. And as it turned out, there were lots more of this kind of unit on level one, which the architects had used really cleverly, cleverly to break up the space, and create different areas on the floor. So the image on the left here shows the architect's visualisation of one of the spaces on level one, and the one on the right is a picture of the actual space taken by the university photographer. You can see the display shelving in both images, and on the right, how we're using it to bring collections into the space and to spark conversations. I was right that it is a lot of work to maintain all of these displays, but actually this has been an absolutely amazing way of highlighting different areas of our collections uh, within the main library that students and re researchers may not be aware of. Um, and we've been able to collaborate with student societies around displays for things like LGBT plus History Month. We've been able to celebrate publications by St Andrew's researchers. We've been able to draw attention to open access monographs, and we've used it to link with the series of exhibitions that take place in the Wardlaw Museum. So it's proved to be actually a really fruitful and positive way of weaving our collections and our spaces together. Another slightly unintended but positive outcome was the incorporation of the two armillary or astronomical spheres on level two. These had been a donation to the university, which it had been difficult to find a location for due to the size. And um, we had essentially been solving a problem for the university in finding space for them um, in the main library. But actually, it's a really nice way of embodying um, the merger of libraries and museums that happened um, in summer 2020. And it helps us to raise awareness by those using the library of the breadth of all of our collections and the ways and places in which they can be encountered. I wanted to um, show you some of the uh, great spaces that we have got um, on level one. Feedback on the spaces that we have there has been really positive. Um, and I wanted you to get as much of a sense as you can of the variety and the quality of the spaces that we have. Um, it is a basement level, um, so it doesn't necessarily have um, as much uh, natural light as you might get in some other places, but the architects have really made the most of um, the natural light that does come through the windows. 
Um, we have lots of different types of seatings. We've got larger tables and desks here. We've got um, areas that have PCs. Um, we have got individual study carols, which you can see on the right. Um, we've got booths, we've got group study rooms. There's a huge variety of different spaces uh, um, within the one larger space. And you can see if you're interested in uh, mechanical and electrical elements, uh, you can see the new heating and cooling system at the top there with the ceiling raft suspended underneath. The picture on the right is a, a dedicated postgraduate area that we have down there. And as part of the redevelopment, we took the opportunity to put in some standing desks and height adjustable desks, um, as well as task lighting at some of the um, spaces and adjustable lighting in the group study rooms. Other library colleagues visiting the space have really commented on the quality of the finish um, and the materials that have been used. The space has really come to life with people in them and you can see student interactions with the display shelving, the collections, the whiteboards and each other in these pictures. And although these particular shots were part of a photo shoot with the university photographer, they're actually a very genuine representation of how these spaces are used. As I've already mentioned, having accessible collections as part of the space was one of our intentional choices. And you can see the rolling stack with the collections in here, as well as a different view of the space from the other end with different kinds of seating. And hopefully you get the impression that it's a bit of an Aladdin's cave of different spaces down there. Level one was very quickly colonized and a noise level established. It's primarily a social space, although the postgraduate area tends to be quieter. We collected feedback during the first few weeks of opening and students really liked the amount of light, the range of spaces and the open and spacious feel. So a typical kind of comment was relaxed but not strictly silent study space with awesome little hidden spots. We made some minor changes to the space in response to the initial set of feedback, including adding some uh, fake plants to the wooden shelving, which uh, the architects had had in their visualizations, and some upholstery uh, on some of the hard wooden bench seating that you can see here. We also asked for automatic door openers to be added for the doors going in from the lift to the level one spaces. We were a bit surprised that these weren't included as standard because we felt it was really important to make the space truly accessible to everybody. I wanted to include some pictures of, of some of the things that we've done on the level two, the entrance level. Um, unfortunately, I don't have very good pictures of this space, um, so you'll just have to come and see it in person to, to appreciate the full effect. The image on the left was taken not long after we opened after Christmas in 2023. Um, so you can see our new help desk on the left. Um, and you can also see that we're awaiting proper manifestations on some of the glass here. So we've just got tape. The image on the right is the architect's visualization. So what's there now is somewhere between the two. Um, and you should note, as I didn't, the uh, display shelving at the rear of the image there. Following the snagging, which took place in May last year, we haven't had an entirely smooth run of, run of things this academic year with plumbing and toilet issues and unfortunately recurring theme. I wanted to say a little bit about some of our, our snagging and our um, lessons learnt. Um, I'm not sure that the architects had really taken on board how intensively the building is used and how often the toilets are flushed. And so the original design of the uh, plumbing didn't really quite work. And we've had several sets of remedial works taking place, including one that's happening right now, even as I speak. And I'm really hoping I can stop thinking about toilets once this one is complete. In terms of other lessons learned, I've included some pictures here of a space which we've called the contemplation room, which is on level four of the library. I mentioned before that a number of elements were transferred from the design at Walter Bower House and the idea of a contemplation or a well-being space was one of these. I think it's fair to say we didn't fully think through translating this from a primarily staff space to a mixed space dominated by student users. And it's also a case that on this occasion, the architect's heart wasn't fully in us creating it, so they didn't really design anything for it. We have added some furniture, as you can see in the picture, but we're currently working with the Disabled Students Network to make some changes so that it can be a better fit with what students would like to use that room for. Students have also commented that lighting throughout the building is harsher than they would like it to be. 
And I think we've realized in retrospect that there is definitely more thought to be given to making the space more usable and comfortable for neurodiverse users, um, of which we have a, an increasing um, percentage of those as part of our overall um, user base. Overall, space continues to be an issue for us, both in terms of space for users and in terms of collection storage. The library now has capacity for 1500 students, so we added about 400 spaces, but on any given day we'll have around 1000 students in the building at any one time and more than that at peak time, so in during revision and exams, and it can still be hard to find a space. And we've done all that we can to maximise the space we have in the main library now, even if we were to reduce the footprint of collections in the building. 1500 remains the upper limit in terms of fire safety capacity due to the width of the staircases and other elements like that. I wanted to end on a, on a positive note um, and we've recently undergone an internal learning and teaching review and we were commended on the redevelopment and the creation of a supportive and highly valued environment that goes beyond offering study materials and promotes shared ownership of the library space. I don't think uh, we could have had a higher commendation than that as far as I was concerned. The high level of use of the library and in particular the new spaces on level one demonstrates their effectiveness and the value of their contribution to the life of the university as a whole. If you would like to please do come and see it and Walter Bauer House. Um, we're always very happy to welcome visitors um, to beautiful Fife. I think that's as much as I was going to say, Katrina. Thanks very much, Emma. That's absolutely wonderful. And um, I was just thinking so many university libraries have 60s and 70s buildings in that kind of brutalist style. We're all just trying to, well, I mean, we, I don't have one at the moment, but I've worked in them and making the best of them. You've really given us a great feel on how to really exploit those. Of course, we did see some fans of brutalist buildings in the in the chat, so I don't want to be too critical, but I'm sure it resonated with many. Um, toilets, yes. I mean, why wouldn't we think about toilets all the time? You know, uh, I, it's great to see so much about toilets there, and I can see again in the chat that everyone was so happy. But um, what I really also really found helpful was the way you talked about the users, the impact on the users, and and how you really thought through, even if you couldn't communicate with them. So thank you so much. Um, we've now got to the point where I was going to invite both of our speakers back on screen, but they're here. And we're moving to the, <clears throat> the, queue, the questions um, section of our, of our workshop or our, our, our event. Um, so um, the, I'd like to start with one for Brian, actually, um, which was um, a question about whether the refurbishment was well received by, by the visitors and the users. Uh, you, you talked about the fact that it has increased staff morale, but has it, it resulted in increased number of visitors uh, or making better use of spaces, for example? Uh, yeah. Uh... I guess most of our work to date has been in the back of office areas um, and that the uh, public areas, it's just the lecture theatre, which was only just finished last month, but, you know, and it's getting positive, positive views by the few events that we've had to date, but, but that's kind of limited in that sense. Um, and the manuscript reading room, um, which again is, is quite niche, uh, I guess. So it's they're not, the places that are completed to date aren't places where we would expect to get much of a change um, in actual user numbers as such, you know. But but what we have done is certainly getting getting positive and and just the general brightening up and freshening up of the of the buildings and the finishes uh, is getting positive comment. Thanks very much, Brian. And then moving to a question for Emma, and I am really interested. Um, I think this is very relevant to the whole cultural heritage side of today's event. Question for Emma, how do you decide what displays to do in the new shelving and are these ever student led? So yes, 
Um, so we're uh, sometimes approached by student societies who want to do a particular display. So um, uh, when it was around the time of uh, Valentine's Day, there's a, a student group in St Andrews called Sexpression that got in touch with us and they wanted to do a display and we're very happy to do that. So either for students to completely curate it themselves and choose the items or for us to work with them and we can suggest items um, and they, they can come set it up or we can set it up for them. Um, um, so quite a lot of our displays this year have been in collaboration with student societies, either because it's been something uh, topical or thematic and we've reached out to them or because um, they've got in touch with us and we've done it that way. Um, we do have a small um, group within libraries and museums and we meet on a regular basis to talk about what the displays are going to be um, and get ideas from staff um, as to what they would like to see there. Um, so that that's another um, good source of um, inspiration. Um, we also have one or two fantastic colleagues uh, who have a previous life as uh, booksellers. Um, and so they can bring their transferable skills from from that uh, arena into what what makes a good display. So we do have a, a staff picks a la Waterstones uh, display with comments and reviews on um, but we also have uh, staff who are very knowledgeable about our collection strengths who've suggested, well, we could have something on graphic novels or we could have something on the books that we have on dance or on photography. Um, so it's it's a combination of different things as well. Um, and academic staff, uh, we've also partnered with to come up with displays. So we've got something going in next week in support of a climate fiction a reading group um, that a member of academic staff is is running so it's been actually a really great way of of um, building up those partnerships with different individuals and groups and increasing that sense of shared ownership of the space ah, but thanks very much and then we've got a question about it, it's again it's a building on that climate theme um I know, Brian, you talked a bit about climate in your presentation. And one of the questions for you here is, is actually about getting rid of old furniture and fittings. Did they go into landfill or, you know, how did you look after the, the environmental considerations there about getting rid of them? Um, well, we tried to reuse in some cases. So, for instance, in the manuscript reading room, we actually um, took down the old large reader's desks, which were dating from the 1980s, and reskinned the top of them with um, uh, architectural desktop, the the, lino, the linoleum uh, product, um, to give us a new finish, uh, and then just put new, replace the fluorescent light boxes with a, a new LED light fitting that was kind of custom designed by local craftsmen. Um, for staff desks, a lot of them are kind of the joints and the brackets are kind of fairly well worn out at that stage. So where we can, we would donate them to a local school or, or some other body that might be interested in them, but inevitably some do end up in a in a landfill or a timber um, kind of reclamation space. Thanks. And then um, uh, an interesting question for you, Emma, um, from a library school student who's doing a uh, uh, research on workplace experiences of female staff in academic libraries. And her question is, um, their question is, uh, what the impact of your uh, changes was on the library staff and how they feel about it? I guess a good question. Um, so as part of the redevelopment, I didn't didn't really talk about this bit, but we also had a new um, staff area on uh, level two. So the office space that we had was also um, refurbished and re put together. And, and that's been combined with a, a kind of general movement across uh, all of our teams in libraries and museums towards uh, kind of hybrid working and smart working so making it possible for people to work out of any of our um, locations whether that's kind of the workroom at Walter Bayer House or uh, the main library office so moving away from the concept of people having their own desks and, and everything being a kind of shared hot desking setup. Um, I think it's fair to say that whilst the redevelopment works were going on um, it was quite a hard time for, for the library. So whilst um, you, you could encourage other people to go somewhere else, perhaps if it was a, a particularly bad day for drilling, if you need to be in the library to, to undertake your work, 
um, you you don't have that luxury. Um, and I must admit, at the beginning of this week, because we've got these uh, snagging works going on for the toilets at the moment, there was a little bit of drilling, and it was like a kind of horrible flashback to to being in the building when there was a lot of of, of drilling going on. Um, so the the library staff were really patient um, throughout the disruption, and I think now do um, benefit from from an improved environment in the staff office. Um, improved kind of setup at the help desk um and we also have a new staff room on on level one um as well um so there there, ha there was kind of quite a bit of pain along the way but i think there are some kind of good benefits now and i, I think we're all very proud of the building and 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 pleased with kind of the way that it's turned out um and in the way that users experience it Thanks. And uh, a nice question for both of you, actually, is what one piece of advice would you give to someone at the beginning of the process? Maybe, Emma, if you start us off and then we go back to Brian. Communication. Communication is key. Um, uh, you, if you can uh, communicate well, frequently, clearly, transparently with your users then do, but also with your staff, because I think that that was such a key point for us to remember to keep uh, updating staff with what's happening and what the next thing is that's coming and, and reminding everybody why you're doing it, um, because we did it largely with the building open. Um, it was a lot of disruption to go through and, and to keep kind of saying, well, this is, this is why we're doing it and keep having those little milestones where you go, well, we've done this much and here's what, what you can see as, as a result of it. So I, I think plan your communication well, communicate often, even if there's nothing to say, um, still send an update to, to remind people where it is that you're heading to. Yeah, and, and I suppose I'd add to that, um, just having a, a clear understanding about what you're trying to achieve. So kind of setting out the parameters of what the project's trying to um, deliver for you and kind of where the stop and the start of that is, you know, like what, what to, to what extent, what are you going to take involved? And I think that that communication piece that Emma talks about is, is that two-way conversation as well about how to get the staff engagement to the experts that did in the, in the organization to feed back into you at the very start what their needs are for the type of service you want to deliver. Um, so that you're using all that in-house expertise to try and have as well developed a briefing document as you can have um, to to kind of progress the the project. And and actually, thanks both of you. Like uh, moving on from that, another another question, which I think for for Brian you probably answered. And being an architect yourself, uh, it's a different scenario, but. Uh, one of the questions we've had is around the interactions between architects and designers and the librarians. And that was really aimed at Emma. But I'd also be kind of interested, you know, Brian, with as someone with a foot in both camps, uh, what your advice to librarians about um, communicating with, uh, with architects and designers would be. So maybe I'll start with you, Emma, and then move back to you, Brian. Um, I, th I think the architects for this project had a really great vision of of what um, what the sp they could do with the space and how they could reimagine it. Um, probably partly because of the point at which I joined, I didn't have as much input into it as maybe in an ideal world I would have liked to have done. I would have liked there probably to have been some more discussion about what we wanted to see from the space, and like I say, all the all the display shelving, which uh, you know, probably if we had been fully apprised of that, we maybe wouldn't have wanted to have, to have had quite as much of that. Um, so, yeah, but we did we we um, we did meet and talk to them regularly, and they were responsive to things when we um, wanted them. I think so that that was positive, but I think more more input at an earlier stage probably would have been beneficial. Yeah, I I, I guess I, as an architect myself, obviously I was always very conscious of kind of not to try and step in and try and design the solution where I've got a team there, the, the Ofspoken Works have got their own 
expert conservation architects who are assigned to our building um, and then they bring in uh, consultant architects to support them to, for the for the larger projects um, so I, I I suppose I'm coming from a space where I I kind of understand the kind of types and the timing of information as to when when I, that needs to get delivered and what to focus on at, at different stages. You know the big picture initially, making sure they're aware of the the broad parameters and then feeding in the detail as they work towards a, a tender preparation. Um, but also. Um, I guess not being afraid to call out when when I kind of feel that the architects are having a little bit of a, a moment to themselves and, and creating a little bit of a um architectural little trophy to themselves in 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 the project. You know, that sometimes you kind of say, well, really, you know, this isn't a priority for us, and that you know, we are a public service and we have to maintain fairly, fairly standardized finishes at times and or whatever. Do you know what I mean? So so there is a kind of a, a checking uh, that needs to happen as well as as a kind of an understanding about where everyone fits into the into the structure of the, of the overall team so your advice to us as librarians not having that kind of architect badge is to be brave and to also speak out in the same way that, that yeah. You- yeah. yeah, trust our instincts. And, and, and as I said earlier, you're kind of the, the experts in what the building has to deliver uh, mm-hmm. for the future. So you need that to actually be possible. And, and, you know, if they need to go through it and explain it again as to why they think their vision will, will do that, well, then you need to keep getting them to tell you and explaining when sometimes it's not that clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great. OK, thanks. Now, two questions about lighting. Um, one was, I think, specifically for Emma, and it was just all about the lighting in, in your building, because you mentioned you don't have much, much natural light, and, and also a question about motion detecting detection lighting. And then another question about harsh lights and white space and advice from both of you, actually, about that. So uh, maybe if we start with the specific one for you, Emma, but anything either of you have to say about um about the whole lighting question in in re- redevelopments um so in terms of the the lighting that we do have um i i don't see see this is where uh, i i am not a good um representative user i think because i i uh, don't um experience any difficulties with the lighting in the main library but a lot of students commented to us that they find the lighting a very harsh and bright we do have um, motion sensors so it's not all on all the time but because the building is so intensively used when students are there all of the lights will be on Um, and I think partly the lighting is of of a certain uh, quality and certain level to enable people to see uh, the items uh, in the stacks so when they are trying to um, identify items on the shelves obviously you need a certain level of light to, to illuminate that so I don't I'm not sure what the answer is in terms of the overall lighting what we're looking at at the moment is creating more spaces where we could provide some adjustable lighting um, so there is adjustable lighting in the group study rooms on level one um, and we're looking to see whether we could put some softer lighting or adjustable lighting in to the contemplation room on level four and we also have what was an assistive technology room which is now maybe going to be more of a low sensory space uh, on level four where we will have either I think adjustable or or softer lighting Um, but having just replaced all of the lighting in the rest of the building I think we're probably um, the the harsher white light is, is here to stay for now but it was really striking uh, how many students commented that they found it problematic? Yeah, it, it is a kind of a common area, and, and I guess it does depend on the type of lighting, whether it's a kind of a LED panel lighting or whether it's a, a spot lighting is that kind of catches your eye and often as a you know for like a we wear glasses for reading, uh, but not for walking around the buildings and. Um, so I, I'm I'm aware that people who are wearing glasses walking around exhibition things where the where the lights kind of come down on top of them is is an issue. Um, a lot of our LED lights now come with a um, color stroke temperature uh, switch inside them, so that you can adjust from a bright light to a less uh, a less blue light to a more warm white, uh, which does help in 
you know, depending on the on the area that we're working in. Um, and obviously there's a uh, there's a huge energy saving in all of this, like the the extreme energy savings that you make by switching over to the LED light system is is obviously a huge, huge benefit from both cost and climate. Um the other thing that I just put in there is it's kind of a, a line to it, but is is the whole area of acoustics that the the harshness of acoustics is also needs to be addressed in each space that modern um, finishes and the way we finish buildings are are inherently kind of harsher and and, and much more reflective and, and so you get a lot more reverberation and so that to find a kind of a comfortable environment it needs to be com comfortably visually um, in terms of the amount of light but also comfortably audibly um in terms of the uh, the the way the acoustics are treated in each space I think I think that's true, and I and, and I think um one thing for us as well in terms of neurodiverse students is that because the main library is so busy, I think actually a lot of students find it overwhelming, um and because you've got to go through that busier space on on level two to get up to the quieter spaces, we have had people saying, well, I just don't come to the library because it's you know basically too, it, there's too much going on, and and so that's a challenge for us as well, in terms of. Uh, almost being the victims of our own success really and therefore not meeting the needs of a, of a specific group of users that that don't find that um, conducive to their study. So the questions are really rolling in which is fantastic thank you everyone I'm going to start to bunch them a little um, so I'm going to start with some very very kind of practical focus questions uh, for both of you um, one is about how do you keep your spaces clean in St. Andrews and do you allow food and drink again in St. Andrews? And then another one is for the National Library of Ireland around the costs of that uh, security that you run in-house and how you cover that. So uh, maybe, Brian, if you could start us off with the security. Okay, our, our security costs are, well, our security arrangements is that we have a an in-house uh, on salary team for kind of daytime effect effectively daytime hours and then we have a contract security service to do our late openings and our uh, overnight because we, we do have a, a 365 24 hour uh, security presence um so but that would all come out of our um government grant if you like bill like that keeps all bills all the electricity and the salaries and the everything paid uh so it, it's just another cost along with cleaning and other utilities uh, in that sense thanks and then emma you're too about food and drink and cleaning so we we do allow food and drink on levels one and two so it is um, any leaded drinks and um, cold food. We don't allow hot food anywhere in the library. Uh, and it is only drinks on levels three and four of the library. Um, but as, as I'm sure many other uh, colleagues out there will know, uh, the policing of food and drink is a, is a thankless uh, task in the library environment. Um, and uh, what qualifies as hot food can can be an interesting um, question. But by and large, I would say students in St Andrews are pretty respectful of the environment um, and don't tend to leave things in a, in a huge mess. Um, there, there's also a strong um, peer uh, kind of reinforcing of, of rules. So if you are making noise on levels three and four of the library, you are more likely to um, attract uh, negative attention from other students rather than from, from um, library staff because it's really kind of understood that that is a silent area and that's part of the whole being at St Andrews is that you understand that you don't make noise on levels three and four and I think to to a, a an extent the food and drink thing follows there as well um we do we do have good support from colleagues in cleaning I mean it's only really at the most peak times that you might notice um kind of the bins need emptying and things but there were there are uh, bins and things in that space you, you just uh, didn't get to see them in those photographs um, and having said I'm going to group things there is actually a question which I'd like to ask both of you which is a, a kind of an overarching question which is what thought did you put into future proofing your libraries against both emerging and as yet unseen changes in library use 
who do mm. that? Yeah. Um, actually, we're doing a horizon scan at the moment of of just looking at that kind of distant future because it is one of those problems. Whenever we any organisation sets out and you you've got your strategic plan or your your strategy and and they typically are a five year plan, which is kind of more like a political uh, time scale rather than a organ long term organisational time scale. Um, so we've kind of recognised that and we're we're currently building in a, a horizon scan to kind of look at those even the more more far-fetched alternative plausible or implausible uh possibilities um certainly what we're doing in our west wing is a where we kind of took a long-term view that a collection storage needs to be fundamentally addressed to current modern standards and that the existing building as storage wasn't conducive to that and then by creating exhibition spaces we're trying to create the spaces that and kind of reduce the energy use and and all of that that and make suitable environments um that would help those uh, act as exhibition spaces um in terms of the way we can control climate um but then that each exhibition will roll and change over time so that they're intended as a shell if you like that gets fitted out with with an exhibition that is appropriate to the time of, of when it's designed um, and for its lifespan. I um, hope that kind of gives a, a kind of sense of that. Thanks. And Emma? I, I would love to say that that we um, have future proof the library and uh, and we did do a fair amount of when we were kind of thinking about comms messages, you know, is this about up, upgrading the library so that it is, you, you know, ready to be the, the, the library of the future or a library that supports the world leading ambitions of the university. I think in reality, uh, what we've done is, is create the right environment for the way that our students and researchers want to use the library now. Um, and we probably needed to do a bit of upgrading and uh, expanding to to be right for what uh, our current users need. I'm not sure that we really have managed to um, do much by way of future proofing, except that they are quite flexible spaces and there's a lot of movable furniture and in theory things could be um, configured quite differently. Um, we've got a couple of other capital projects in the university at the moment that we're looking at and it strikes me in all of the conversations about those, even though those buildings are at an earlier stage and not going to exist for, for several years, we are still very fixated on what is it that we need now and how are students taught now, how do they learn now, as opposed to how will they be learning in five years time. And, and I don't think we're very good at making that kind of imaginative leap. We're good at identifying a deficit in what we already have, but not necessarily in, in predicting forward to what, what we might need. So if anybody has any um, good good suggestions on that one, I, I'd be glad to hear them as well. Yeah, I mean, I suppose like, you know, this doesn't only apply to spaces, but, you know, RLUK did a lot of work, oh, maybe even 10 years ago now, but uh, and so did quite a few libraries uh, around scenario planning and, um, you know, looking at futures. So, I did find that a, a useful exercise. Um, I think we've probably time for one last round of questions before we wrap up. And I'm going to just uh, kind of group together a few questions for you, Emma, that um, do feel like they've got similarities. So one is the collaboration study space. Um, what categories of users and is there a reservation um, do you, sorry, do you reserve them to specific categories of, of users? And then um, about your postgraduate space, what, how do you define a postgraduate? Um, is it well used? Is there pressure from undergraduates to open it up? And is it part of a broader university PGR, a postgraduate research space strategy? Um, so yeah, if you could uh, briefly just touch on those. Thanks, Emma. And then I will wrap up. Uh, so in terms of access to spaces and, and whether we have a reservation system, um, we asked students this year um, whether they wanted bookable study spaces in the library because we hadn't had a strong message on that up to this point. Um, and the suggestion was that they did, but we also know that people like uh, first come, first served. So we've actually made 
uh, some of our group study rooms on level level two bookable, but all of the spaces on level one are first come first served. So it's it's whoever um, gets there first, and the booths fill up uh, very early in the mornings. Um, in terms of the postgraduate space, it's postgraduate tour and postgraduate research. Um, I, I think. Uh, the postgraduate taught population at St Andrews gets uh, slightly marginalised and perhaps doesn't, there's not a huge number of them, they perhaps don't feel that anybody um, particularly cares about them so it was really important I think that we were offering a space for PGTs as well as PGRs and there is a lot of work going on in the university at the moment around the needs of PGT students in particular and how we can ensure that they are, they are having a, a, a strong um, student experience at St Andrews so there are some other postgraduate only spaces and we have uh, another postgraduate only reading room which is across the, the road in North Street in Martyrs Kirk. Um, undergraduates sometimes would like access to the postgraduate space and we certainly have had that feedback um, but not not overwhelmingly so they're not we don't have too many kind of people pressing their noses to the glass and wanting to get in. <laughs> 